Have you guys ever found yourself in a situation that you thought was going to be something, and it turned out to be something else completely different? I'm thinking, like, I thought I was going to walk into the store, and it turned out there was a robbery going on. Or I thought I was going to buy a toy for my daughter, but it turns out I bought her a car instead. Like, sometimes you go into situations, I say that because I'm a whoop father. Izzy has me wrapped around her pinker, or pink pinker. That's a new word. We just made it up. It's going in the dictionary of Josh, right? So sometimes you go into a situation and you're like, this is going to be great. It's going to be awesome. I know what's going to happen. I am prepared for what's going to happen. I was a Boy Scout for like seven years. So what's the motto? Be prepared, right? Like everything is good. And then you get in the middle of it and you're like, what in the world is happening? Uh, You know, this week, our Bible hero in our Heroes of Old series found himself in a situation I think that would qualify. Michael Puckard found himself in that same situation as he dove into the ocean. And I think we have a picture. This is Michael right here. Michael was diving to catch crabs, the little crustaceans, right? And he dove into the ocean off of his boat to dive down and get one of his crabs and found himself diving into the mouth of a humpback whale. How would you like to say, I'm going to get me some lobster and find out that you were the lobster, right? That's not exactly the way you think your day is going to go. He's quoted later on. He says, I thought to myself, hey, this is it. Have you guys ever had a moment like that in your life where you're like, "Uh uh-oh, I'll see y'all later. I'm going to the pearly gates. Michael thought, hey, this is it. I'm going to die But he didn't. He was in the whale's mouth for a little less than a minute before he was spat out. Michael got a second chance at life. If you were here today looking for a second chance, then I would venture to say that you're in the right place. If you were here today and you have turned your back on someone or something or maybe a calling that God has placed on your life and you're wondering, what exactly should I do? I would say that you're probably in the right place. If you are here today seeking a God who is both powerful enough to burn down your enemies, but graceful enough to save them, then we have a message for you this morning. Jonah was swallowed by a great fish and given a second chance at life. So a little bit of background. This story takes place somewhere around 760 B.C. And Jonah, the, the prophet, the, the preacher, the guy who's going to spread God's word, right? He is called to go to Nineveh. Now, a little reasoning behind this. Nineveh was about 500 miles northeast of the capital of where Jonah lived in the northern kingdom, right? Jerusalem, Israel, has already had the civil war. They've split into the northern and southern kingdom. And so Jonah is called to go up and over into what would be modern-day Syria now, and he was going to proclaim to Nineveh that God has has called them evil, they're blasphemous, they worship other gods, they're lustful, they're immoral, they do all these horrible things. But he wants Jonah to go say, repent, repent. And turn from your sins. And so God instructs Jonah. He says, hey, go to this place. In Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. One quick thing here. Greatness does not preclude evil. Greatness does not preclude evil, at least in the way that we term it, right? We look at a car, and the shinier it is, the bigger it is, the faster it is, the louder it is, the more great we think that car is, right? We look at a person, and the taller they are, the better looking they are, the stronger they are, the more successful they are, the greatness we see in them exudes, right? But God looks at something else. Nineveh as spoken elsewhere in scriptures, had a population of around 120,000 people. 
Kernersville has slightly more than 30,000. So it's only four times the size that we are. High Point, Winston, and Greensboro all would swamp Nineveh as far as population. But back then, 120,000 was a massive city. And so God says, hey, Jonah, go to this city, the great city of Nineveh, to the capital of the Assyrians, your enemies, and call out against me that their evil has come up before me. Now, 40 years after this story, just to kind of highlight how big of enemies they were, Assyria would come in and conquer the northern kingdom and take them into slavery. So they're not exactly good next door neighbors. You know the people on like the old shows where they had like the Brady Bunch and they went and asked for flour from their neighbor and they gave it to them and everything is good. That's not these guys. They're the ones who threw stuff at you. They're the ones who called the police on you. They're the one, they're not good neighbors. And Jonah doesn't want to go to them. It goes on in verse three. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. And he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish. Let me just say, if you ever tried to say Tarshish ten times fast, it is not easy, and I will not torture you with it, but uh, don't pick on me too much for it. Away from the presence of God, God said go, and Jonah said no. Now, Before we go any farther, there's a point that I'd like to camp on for a moment. A lot of people throughout history have pointed a lot of fingers at Jonah, saying, oh, here's a prophet that hated a group of people so much that he decided they were unworthy of God's salvation. Here's a prophet. Here's a, a man of God who judged other people so harshly that he decided that they were not worthy for that. But if we're honest, and we try to be here, right? If we're honest, we are very good at being very accepting and comfortable of people who are God-loving like us. And in fact, let's take it a little further. We're very good at accepting people like us. But if they're different, we tend to have a hard time with it. Our culture is addicted to labels that try to make everything easier to put into a box so I can take that box and put it on the shelf. And so I look at Carly and I say, Carly is this and she's that and she's this and she goes in this neat little box and I put her on the shelf where I can either discard her for later or I can keep her for use down the road. And we do that with people. We like to do it with Democrats and Republicans. How many guys have ever had a conversation? Oh, those Democrats, those left-wing commies, oh man. Oh, those Republicans, those right-wing, nutso, gun-loving, crazy-toting, hat-wearing, I was trying to go on off the off my hip, right? It's crazy, right? We look at that, but it's rarely as simple as one label that you can place on somebody. We love to do it with color. Everybody loves to say, oh, they're black or they're white or they're ethnicity, or we talk about how much money they make. That's a label we put. Are you low class? Are you middle class? Are you high class? Are you the elite? In North Carolina, if you make over $350,000 a year, you are in the top 1% of earners. I need new shoes. Just saying. Any y'all in here? I've been wearing these for a while, right? But sometimes we love to put these labels on people, and so we point fingers at Jonah when we really like to do the same things. Every one of us in here has our Nineveh that we are unwilling to reach or unwilling to go to for whatever reason, whether it's a good reason, whether it's a bad reason, whether it's an excuse, or whether it's just my way of thinking. You can't save, though, what you destroy. You cannot save that which you destroy. And here's the problem with our mindset. If I put a label on somebody or some people group, and then my goal becomes to destroy that people group, how can I save that which I seek to kill? 
In Christianity, our goal as Christians is not to destroy non-Christians. Our goal as Christians, the way we win the war that we're in is by bringing those and crossing them over from death to life. We're trying to resuscitate the people in America and in the world. We say, hey, look, we've got something that can save you from your sins. We've got something that can save you from this life you've been living, and you have to place your trust in him. But if we say, no, I won't go, how can we save that which God has called us to do? It's very interesting here. God did not punish Jonah for being too soft-hearted. God did not punish Jonah for being too forgiving. God did not punish Jonah for trying to save the people that were despicable in his eyes. He punished Jonah because he turned the other way. In Jonah chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, it says, But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. So we jumped ahead a little bit here. Jonah is now on the boat. He's going across this river. He's, he's saying, I'm getting away from all this stuff, right? And God hurls a great wind upon the sea. And there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners who were afraid and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was on the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. If you have ever thought about hiding from your problems, I think Jonah just gave us a very great lesson of how that looks. How many of you guys have woken up in the morning and you've turned on the news or you've opened up your phone and you said, nah, and you lay back in bed and you pull them covers up and you take that pillow and you put it over your head and you're like, not today, buddy, right? Like maybe I just need five more minutes. Maybe I need five more days. Sometimes the last year, it feels like you need five more weeks. And Jonah essentially said, oh, look, there's, there's some waves. Oh yeah, God's mad at me. I'll tell you what, it's a great time for a nap. I bet you by the time I wake up, it'll all be over. And so what happens is the crew of the ship finds out. They go downstairs because they're talking to their gods. They're praying. They're throwing stuff overboard. By the way, the stuff they're throwing overboard is their belongings and their provisions. It's not like they were just carrying extras. These are things they were going to use to sell, to survive on, and their personal belongings. So they're really, really invested in not dying. And they go downstairs, and they're like, huh, everybody else is upstairs. Something is not the same. And in verse 8, it says, They said to him, Tell us whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to him, I am Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told him. Jonah comes clean, and all of a sudden everybody is petrified. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down. For you know that it's because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O oh Lord, let us not perish for this man's life. In other words, don't blame me for what he did. And lay not the innocent blood upon us, for you, O oh Lord, has done it as you pleased. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. You know, it's fascinating to me here. One thing that really stood out this week as I was studying this, that Jonah would rather die than submit to God's calling on his life. You would think everybody goes right and the whole ship's crew is coming before him and they're like, hey, what is going on? And he says, it's my fault. It's my bad. And they're like, well, tell us what to do. You would think Jonah would be like, Look, guys, I'm going to go downstairs. 
I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, get my little prayer pose. I'm gonna talk to God and tell Him everything's good, right? I, I'll talk with Him. It's all gonna be fine. Did y'all like my prayer pose? I don't, I don't know what that was. It just came out, right? And it's all gonna be good. It's all gonna be fine. But instead, He's like, Nah, just throw me over the side, guys. Like. He doesn't talk about prayer. They don't try to hold hands and sing kumbaya. There's nothing of that sort. He goes straight to, I would rather die than follow God's command. Jonah chapter 1 verse 17, the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And he was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. You know, nobody ever said that your second chance would come with five-star accommodations. In this case, I think it's particularly fitting since the fish was more submissive to God's will than his own prophet. When we find ourselves in the middle of a storm, in the belly of a fish, And we're wondering, how in the world did I get in here? And maybe, how in the heck can I get out of here? It might be a good place to start with reorienting the way we think about God's calling on our life. In Jonah, the last part of chapter 2, verses 9, it says, What I have vowed, I will make good. Jonah says, all right, God, you asked And I said, no, you insisted and I ran away. You asked again and I got on a boat. You blew up the boat and now I'm in a fish. So I'm now capitulating to what you want me to do. And so Jonah says, okay, that's fine. And it goes on in the later part of this, the Lord commands the fish to spit Jonah out onto dry land. In fact, the term that he uses, vomited him onto dry land. I don't know about you guys, but I don't think I want to be vomited onto anything, by anything, much less a great fish. It's not a great start to the day. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, and he tells Jonah, all right, look, you're here, you're a little stinky, I'm going to keep my distance, but you go ahead and head back to to Nineveh. We're going to start this over again. And so Jonah makes this super long journey. In chapter 3, Jonah walks through the streets of Nineveh, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. You know, there's an old expression in the business world that says, deadlines spur action. And I think the people here found that true because it says, from the lowliest peasant to the king himself, all of Nineveh believed God and repented. And in Jonah chapter 3, verse 10, it said, When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring them the destruction he had threatened. You know, a lot of us, as the band gets ready to come back up and play our song of invitation, think at this point, if it stopped here, it would be a happy ending, right? Like if Jonah, like he had a rough start, but he got his stuff together and he said, hey, look, I'm finally going. And he went to the city and it was all good. He accomplished his goal. The whole city turned. He was a prophet. That was literally exactly what he was supposed to do. But he's not. He's upset. He's depressed. He's sad. And most of all, he's angry. In chapter 4, verse 1, it goes on, But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? In other words, this is why I told you I didn't want this job. This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. 
Jonah says, I'm so angry, I wish I was dead. Have you guys ever, you know, sometimes you, you look at somebody and you're like, oh, I'm so angry, I could just choke them. Oh, man, I'm so angry, I just kick the wall. Or you do something in anger that is illogical. And this is where Jonah finds himself. He said, God, I'm so angry. This is what I told you. This is why I didn't want this job. He hated the Assyrians so much that he didn't want God to lavish his grace upon them. He didn't want them to be saved. He wanted them to get justice. I was listening to a pastor one time preach, and it was really stuck with me. He said, justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve, but grace is getting what you don't deserve in a positive light. Jonah did not want grace for these people. He wanted them to pay for their sins. But at the end of the day, God brought him around so that he could see, you know what? reason why you recognize all this grace is because you're part of the people that I have brought out of Egypt, that I provided for in the desert, that turned their back on me there, and that I provided food for, and they turned their back on me again, and I took them into the promised land, and they turned their back on me again, and I, and I gave them a kingdom, and they turned their back on me again, and, but I was still there. You know, if we've learned anything through this Hero of Old series, it's that you cannot judge a hero by his cover, right? Man, you look at King David. We talked about him a few weeks ago, and he was a man after God's own heart, but he did some horrible, despicable things. But if I found out my daughter Izzy's friends were doing, I'd be like, "Uh uh-uh. You ain't hanging out with him. I don't care how much like God's heart they have. They don't have Josh's heart. I'm kicking them out. But he was still a hero. He still stepped up and did what God called him to do. He still came back to God after he made those mistakes. And I think this is a promise that all of us can have. Everybody in here has a calling on their life. And almost everybody in here at some point in their life has probably questioned whether or not it's worth it. Should I go? Should I walk? Should I work? Should I sacrifice for this calling? And maybe we've turned our back on that before because it is hard. There was nothing easy about what God asked Jonah to do here. And I think if we are honest with ourselves, we all have people that if God told us to go save them, we'd be like, man, God, are you sure? We all have our personal Nineveh. The question is not if we have it, but if we're walking towards it or running away from it. You know, Jonah's story arc in this, it goes like this. He says to God at first, I won't go. And then he says to God, I'm sorry I didn't go while he's sitting in the belly of a whale. And then he says, hey, you know what, God, I will go. And then afterwards he says to God, you know what, I'm sorry that I did go. Nineveh's conversion story goes like this. Hey, we are enemies of God. They figured that out after Jonah came to them. And then it was much simpler for them. They said, you know what? We don't want to be enemies of God. And God's message to Jonah and to Nineveh was, Jonah, I have mercy for Nineveh. Jonah, I have mercy for you. And Jonah, you need to have mercy for Nineveh. You know, God's mercy is so wide, we should dare not to narrow it. Prejudice, preconceived notions, all of those things will narrow your mindset much, much away from what God has called you to be. You know, I read the, the, a post this week, and I didn't get the person's name, but it went like this. I thought it was really good. As we wonder why we do this crazy stuff for Jesus, as we wonder why we come and sing songs and we listen to these sermons and why we give and why we serve, why we go to our personal Ninevehs, why we do things that we don't want to do, 
went like this. It said, Jesus is the greatest man in history. He had no servants, yet they called him master. He had no degree, yet they called him teacher. He had no medicines, yet they called him a healer. He had no army, yet kings feared him. He won no military battles, yet he conquered the world. He committed no crimes, and yet they crucified him. He was buried in a tomb, but yet he still lives today. You know, sometimes, as we look back over these heroes, I see a reoccurring theme almost every every Sunday. And it is that God doesn't call perfect people into his service. God calls imperfect people into his perfect plan. And maybe you're here today and you have been called by God, but you don't feel good enough to be called by God. I want to reassure you that that doesn't matter. Jesus turned water into wine. He can turn your service into great service. Maybe you're here today and you've never accepted that calling on your life. Maybe you've turned your back on it. Our God is a God of second chances. Maybe you're here today and you find yourself in the belly of a whale. And you've got seaweed wrapped around your head like Jonah did. And you're sitting in a whole bunch of nasty gunk like Jonah was. And, and you're worried that this point in your life will never let you go. But just like in this story, sometimes the worst places, the belly of a whale, can seem like our prison when really it's our ferry boat to the next part of God's plan. 